Hello, everyone, and welcome back from Thanksgiving. I hope you guys had a great little break and you were safe and stuffed yourselves full of turkey. Uh, my name is J. Todd Coleman, Creative Director, and I'm here with... Thomas Blair, Design Director. And in the and background, we got is... Tiggs. I don't know if you guys can see Tiggs or not, So, because I'm not looking at the, uh, at the stream. Uh, but we got Tiggs in the background. She can wave or say hi. Hi. And this is a, another episode of the Artcraft Q&A for Crowfall, rounding out December of 2020. Got to keep the cards going. It's tradition, yep. folks. And we, <laughs> we're nearing the end of the line on, uh, on the cards, I think, because we're not going to continue doing these, I would expect, after we go into launch. We'll have to figure that out. We actually haven't talked about what our communication schedule is going to turn to post-launch, but that's not the topic for today. That's the topic for another day. We got the status update on 6200s, which everyone has been playing now for over a month, right? They've been playing the new, uh, the talent change, the discipline change, our first big whack at that. And then all of the feedback that they have provided has produced a total of 690 powers changes since we showed it to them on test. And in this cycle, we actually dedicated... Uh, two designers to just sitting in live and responding to feedback as it came in, which is something we haven't done in the past. Typically we kick something out to you guys. It's out there for whatever it takes us to build the next milestone. And we generally only really hot fix in emergency cases if something is really, really broken. Uh, this cycle, we put two designers out there and they responded to the balance feedback that everybody was feed through the forums channels and all basically the on a came. daily basis right like every day they were they were collecting the the feedback and then running it through the algorithms and then making changes yeah so it was great to get all that feedback we got a lot of bugs additional bugs fixed as well as um, a lot of balance tweaks based on info you guys were giving us and so. that's still going on like we're not done with that we're still in that process too we're still collecting the bugs so keep them coming because yeah. 700 is not enough. <laughs> we need to fix all the things. We uh, They just shifted back into 6300 as we're getting ready to collapse our branches and start talking about 6300 as its release is fairly imminent. Yep. So that's going to be the topic of today. But uh, the, the 6200 cycle was, was extremely positive for us. And I'm happy that we were able to keep doing the balance and tweak stuff on live, which is something we really haven't done in the past. So... There you go. Do you have anything else about 6200, Todd? Uh, no, no. I, I want to thank everybody for giving the feedback. I mean, ultimately, uh, I, I say it all the time, but we couldn't be making this game without direct feedback from you guys. So please keep the comments coming. Um, we do listen to them, even though we don't respond to everything immediately. We do always discuss them internally and figure out uh, what needs to stay in the game, what needs to go, what direction we need to take, how things need to change. Um, I the term crowd designed in the past, but this this has been a very interesting project because we've had such a direct communication with you guys since the beginning, really, since the earliest days uh, of, of uh, the project. So um, thank you for that. And please do not stop with the feedback. We, we really do appreciate it and move on it. So it, it kind of dominates most of our design conversations. In right. I mean, so, but and, and again, we, we meet every day to talk about balance issues that you guys are bringing up, uh, rate, collates, all that stuff. And we sit down as a powers group and we all talk about those things. So we at least talk about it uh, if you post something. He will definitely gather it and we'll talk about it. And it may or may not lead to an action item, but somebody is at least discussing uh, what the problem is there. Because we're, we're better at sussing out, trying to, trying to translate what you're saying. It may not actually be that specific power. It may be an interaction with something else. We try and suss it out and come up with a solution for you. So... That's a uh, topic of balance. Then we've got uh, the topic of, let's see, uh, the, the test server. Right now, again, we're getting ready for 6300, so we're going to be closing that down so no one can get in there except for us because we like to kind of see the early uh, problems before showing them to you. There's some funny ones in the 6300 cycle that we never wanted you guys to see, and uh, we, we suss those out when we go to test first. Uh, before we open it up for general consumption. Uh, 
Yeah, we, we play internally, of course, on our internal servers, but we like to actually get it up and running on the test server that you guys will see it on, and then we can log in and check it out there. And, of course, we've got a, a pretty exhaustive QA group who worked th right through the Thanksgiving break, so special shout-out to them. Thank you, guys, because we really do want to get 6300 in your hands as soon as we possibly can. There's some pretty significant things in it that we're going to talk about. But psych, uh, basically psychologically, like what, what philosophically, I guess, where we're at right now in the project. So we're at the point now where over the last, I don't know how many years, five years, five plus years, we've been adding systems organically, right? We've kind of built a new system out. We propped it up. We make changes to it over time. And then we move on to the next system and we just kind of keep layering things on like that. So now we're to the part of the project, which is... Um, uh, it's it's time to make hard choices into what we're going to keep, what we're going to lose, what we're going to change. So you can see that we've already started this process with the domains and disciplines. We took a hard look at all the things we built and said, okay, so we don't think this is to the degree of customization that we want. We need to make some fairly significant changes that we are rearranging pieces that we already had. Um, so today, I, this is going to be like, I guess, the third time, because I've done this to you guys twice now in the past. The first time we did it was when we did the race class swap. So you didn't have the choice of doing race and class. It was just archetypes, kind of like a MOBA. You, If you wanted to play a ranger, well, here's the ranger you're going to play. You don't get to pick your gender. You don't get to pick your class. You don't get to pick anything about them. Uh, you, you don't, you just, you're going to have to play that particular character. So we made that change and it kind of shook the foundations of what the game was. Looking back now, I still believe, even though it added a tremendous amount of time and effort to the overall project, I still believe it was the right answer. Like I can't imagine, you know, shipping the game with with archetypes as we originally intended so uh so i've got another one of those that i'm dropping on you today and we've actually been blair and i have been noodling on this now for a long time I, it was probably a year ago that i told him i wanted to think about making this change uh it is foundational it is something that we talked about way back in kickstarter but it is also something that i feel like um personally needs to be done before launch so this was not just a um it may feel to you guys like i'm jerking the wheel but actually i've been thinking about this for a long time so let's talk a little bit about passive training so passive training was originally put in because we thought it would be a uh, interesting way to do long-term uh, retention and advancement uh, in the game. And we thought that it would uh, be interesting. It actually was originally based around the idea that I mentioned of archetypes. And the thought was it would be a really nice VIP benefit because players can have advancement of multiple archetypes at one time. Um, because you can only play one archetype on one character at a time. So therefore it was cool because it gave me more options to play, but not necessarily pay to win. We later changed from archetypes over to classes and then subsequently dropped all of those um, passive training trees because we just decided that we didn't like it. So here we are now towards the end of the project. And um, I've got a handful of reasons for thinking this, uh, and I'll go through them, but the basics was, uh, at the end of the day, I don't find the system fun. So I don't know how else to explain it than that. But I went to Blair one day about a year ago, and I said, I don't think this system is good. I don't like it. I don't like the way it makes the game feel, and I certainly don't like what it does to us from a design standpoint, because it means that the game is in a constant state of change which makes it entirely impossible to balance, right? A month after launch, you're looking at an entirely different set of min-max numbers than you are the month of launch. And a month later, it's different again. So I came to Blair and I said, I want you to go and do the research of what it would take to pull out passive training. So we've done that research now, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to move all of the things that were previously gated in, by passive training into the game so that there will no longer be time gates. And we're going to simplify the system down. All the numerical benefits that were given in those trees are being moved also down into disciplines and runestones, and they'll be spread around. Um, so we're, we're going to be able to, to accommodate that. Um, but I, even, you know, ultimately, when I ask people internally, you know, hey, what do you think of this system? The responses that I usually got were, you know, 
well, we've spent a lot of time and effort on it. And that's absolutely true. But in and of itself, that's not a reason to keep something, right? Uh, it's very confusing. I don't really understand it. I always forget about it and I forget to log in and spend my points. And then when I do log in and found out that I didn't spend my points, it makes me feel crappy. Um, so it's not a good feeling. It's a bad feeling. I don't like that. I feel gated. It makes my friends not want to play because they find out that they're at a mathematical disadvantage for coming late. So the responses I got were not generally not positive. There were a few positives in there. People saying, well, I kind of like the fact that for playing longer, I get a mathematical advantage. But at the same time, the flip side of that is people who are not playing longer are less inclined to join the game because they're at a mathematical disadvantage. Not one person that I talked to internally said that they found the system fun. That's a problem to me. So ultimately, um, I know that this is going to be, to some people, rejoicing in the streets, and to some people, this is going to be blasphemy, and they're going to hate it. I can't read the chat right now because I don't have it on my screen, so I don't know how this is being well-received or not well-received. But fun fundamentally, I feel like we originally set out to do it. We built it, and we tried it. We gave it a fair shot. I just don't like the way it feels. It feels, in fact, to me at odds with our core promise of this game, which is with resetting campaigns, I can start a new game on an even playing field. It feels at odds with that. So after a lot of deliberation, we decided that the right answer was to pull it out. So there you go, folks. <laughs> um, so, Blair, are you looking at the chat? I'm curious what those oh, yeah, thoughts actually, are. Uh, a lot of people are very positive about it. I really haven't seen any negatives about it. Um, again, as Todd pointed out, it created from, for us a very difficult way. Well, let me, let me put it this way. I've never had such a difficult time on a project figuring out what was wrong with something because of where people were at in the skill trees. You right, get a yeah. lot, a, a lot of comments and it's just impossible to know the context. Generally, you have some type of context. All right, this player is playing this class, this race, so they have these things. They may be weak because of X, Y, or Z. Um, in Crowfall, with the skill trees and just the explosion of directions you could go, we could never really pinpoint exactly where problems were stemming from because it may feel really good at three days in, but by day 15, you have no clue where people went. So to, to solve any design problems, generally we have to kind of put ourselves in, in where the player is at that moment in our progression cycle and try and figure out what's wrong. And it just, it was so, it had so many variables, we just couldn't do that. And it also- well, Like I said, you're, you're trying problem. to hit a moving target, right? So, so a month in, your top end players who are min-maxed are- now here, and there you're dealing with a whole different set of numbers than you were a month ago and two months in. But new players who are just coming in, they're still at that original spot. So now you're hitting at a people that only started a month ago or here. So it's now you've got a spectrum of balance problems and it just gets worse over time. So really a, a year ago, the reason that I started to go down this path was when I started to really put serious effort into trying to design the catch-up mechanic. Because we talked about a bunch of different catch-up mechanics. And at the end of the day, Every solution I came up with was was problematic, convoluted, a hell of a lot of work, and still at the end of the day had issues. I, so that told me there was something that just inherently was wrong. I mean, you guys know my background was Shadowbane, right? I, a big chunk of the reason that I wanted to go back and and re and kind of pass over that d design was because I feel like there was a great game there that was never given a shot for a lot of reasons. And um, so as I've been looking at um, the game that we're about to launch, right, the game that we're we're trying to get you know through beta so that we can launch it. When I see deviations and things aren't working, I constantly go back and ask myself, okay, well, was this a problem in Shadowbane? And if, if yes, then how do we fix it? And if no, then why? Why was it not a problem? And so these kind of dangling bits that are hanging out there, like this one, there was no passive training in Shadowbane. That just wasn't a thing. So it was just another kind of nail in the coffin for me to ultimately say, which is a hard decision, guys. I mean, this is, we put a lot of time and effort into this, right? Um, but if it's, if it's the right answer for the game, then it's just the right answer for the game. 
and that's part of the that's part of the tough thing. What's funny is in a normal game cycle, a lot of times these these things are not seen. This one probably would have been seen because it would have been in beta. Um, but a lot of times these decisions are, you know, you, it's not the first time I've seen in beta major systems get cut out of a game because you're just like, hey, here's where we're at with this thing. Here's what it's going to take to finish it out. And even then, we don't like what it's doing. Let's just pull it out. Now that's that said. Will we look at adding anything like it in the in the future? I, I don't know, May, maybe, but right now I don't really see a need for it. Um, I, I don't like the the negatives that came from it. To me, didn't outweigh the positives that we're getting from it so much so that I finally made the call. I just want to pull this out. So yeah, and it was um, again. This wasn't a call that was made lightly on the passive skills. I mean, I know personally a lot of designers have spent a lot of time on the skill system, a lot of weekends trying to, to work those things, rework them, finally get them into an appealing shape. Um, and to have to just pull that out, it definitely is, uh, it happens. So a lot of us are, are used to uh, big systems that you've worked on and spent an incredible amount of time getting cut. Kind of sucks from a creator standpoint because so much effort was put into that. But if it's not working, then we can come up with something else. Yeah, so. and ultimately, right, go back to thinking about it as a new player who's not playing the beta right now. They don't hear about Crowfall until we're about to launch, you know, or they hear about it a month after launch, right? Is this system going, is the system being in going to make them more or less likely to say, yeah, that's a game I want to play? It's going to make them less likely. If the system's not in, it's going to make them more likely. And that's a big deal. I mean, I think one thing that we've definitely learned over beta is that our game is very sensitive to um, the fun at being in larger numbers of people engaged in the game, right? Some of the most fun we've had was when we announced beta because we saw a big influx of new players and you guys had some great campaigns as a result. So things that drive people out of the game and say, no, I don't want to try it. Generally, I, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like those. We need to be trying to attract more people in because in a PVP focused game, people are the content. Play The other players are the content. So anyway, so I just wanted to go through first the why so, like, the why are we doing this? Why was this decision made? And then we're going to go through with Blair a little bit of the how. But before we jump into the how, I want to make one point that this was not something that we could do instantaneously. Like, we knew that it was going to have to be staged out. The work was going to have to be staged out. So what Blair has done right now is put it, moved all of the pieces that previously were in the passive training tree into the active components of the game. But we don't have... We don't have time. We didn't have time right now to do any real engineering. So we had to use the tools that we had, which means that right now, a lot of those pieces have fallen into the crafting system and the gathering system. And those things rely on RNG. And I know you guys hate that. So I'm asking for you to have a little bit of patience as we put these things in place now. We'll show you how we're moving them, but this is not the final stop of the train. This is just what we could do immediately because we had to, you know, just, you can't just rip it out. Like we ripped it out and all of a sudden there's a bunch of holes in the design. It's like, well, previously this thing over here was gated behind months of training. Now it's just not in the game at all. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> so we had to actually get the stuff back in. He used the tools that he had to do it. Um, so what we're going to show you today is the initial first step in that regard, We'll come back later and revisit the system, just like we're still going back now and revisiting disciplines. And uh, this is probably not the last time, by the way, we're going to have some some overhaul -y stuff that happens here at the end, because we finally have all the pieces now to try and make this game play nice together, right? We, to me, it feels like we have all the major pillars, but they aren't necessarily sinking. You know, the uh, the forts are online, and that's great. But as a result, why would I do harvesting? Because I should just take the forts. That's a balance problem. The great thing is we have the systems now. We never had them before. You can't balance the system you don't have. But now is the time for us to go through and start to get all these things to sync up. Sometimes that requires an overhaul. Sometimes it requires cutting them. And sometimes it just requires mathematical balance. So, so Blair, do you want to talk a little bit about the current uh, setup yeah. that you've got for how this stuff has moved over? And then we yep. can talk a little bit about ways that we might ad adapt it. And by the way, we're not totally set on that. So if you guys want to chime in and give us your feedback and thoughts on the forums and everywhere, we're more than happy to listen. I know that you guys just learned about this, so it's a lot to digest. Um, so digest it and think through it. And then let's talk about what it means going forward. Okay. So uh, the 
that basically the, the the passive trees, as you know, had a good chunk of the player power put in them. They also had a bunch of activities like harvesting, and they unlocked a lot of things. And the crafting trees had a bunch of things that uh, they made your crafting better. And then more recently, I had started to throw some passives in there just because I didn't have the full uh, map done for what's coming in 6300. But now that's all been settled. So now that the passive trees are gone, what we did was we took the entire stat budget from every one of the uh, old three tracks of combat, crafting, and exploration, and we sum totaled everything that we were giving out. Then what I did was uh, took those numbers and distributed those amongst the, uh, as you saw in 6200, the disciplines and the specialty belts. So you basically have two vectors of advancement, and now the stats that were on the skill trees can be found in one of those two locations. Now, harvesting needed a progression mechanic as well, so it is very similar to the crafting one, where you will essentially gain advancement in there as you do the activity. So as you go out and destroy named resources, you will sometimes have a chance to proc a discipline. Why don't uh, Emily pop up the minor exploration overview? So what she's going to put on screen is a giant overview of basically the whole uh, progression process through the disciplines down into there. It's called the specialty toolkit for the exploration disciplines. All of the harvesting options are available to you. You can t pick up Gravedigger right off the bat if you want to. You can pick up Miner. You just go to a vendor and you buy the initial discipline. So the initial discipline will unlock the intermediate tools. And basically, when you're using an intermediate tool and you hit the appropriate resource type, you just have a chance for a discipline to go flying out, which is the green quality discipline. And this is the part I don't like, by the way. So this is the, the part, and we, we had a conversation about it this morning, which means that our advancement right now is based on RNG, and I, I don't like that. I know you guys don't like that either. So that's an area that we know we have to look at. But it's all we could do with the system that we had. And again, I couldn't just have Blair excise the passive training system and not do something. So he came back right. and said, okay, well, right now, I'll just put them on the loot tables, and we'll use that as our advancement mechanic. So... Imagine that as a box that we know we're going to swap out at some point later. Don't worry about that. Like, put that to the side for right now. I'm saying that because I I know that I'm going to have a bunch of threads of people saying, hey, I don't like this. We, we're aware that you don't like it. We don't like it either. That's a stopgap for now. Yeah, so you will basically, you will get advancement via doing the activity. So if you want to raise your logging, you will basically go out and chop trees because you were going to do that anyways. If you go out and get ore, you're going to hit ore nodes. The difference between uh, this model is more that it's all on you. So if you want to go out and whack a bunch of trees and get uh, more advancement, do that. There is no passive I need to sit around and wait two weeks for uh, tools to unlock or a specific power to unlock. You'll notice that from the overview, we'll, we'll zoom in, but you'll see that there's stuff in there like the energetic harvesting, the harvesting pips, a bunch of stats. Uh, basically, all of the stuff that you had to wait before is now limited by how fast you can do it, which is pretty similar to any active advancement in any of the MMORPGs. Yeah, the, the other thing that we haven't done yet, and I definitely want to do, and I, we need to do this actually for monsters as well, is right now we have a bunch of people who are in the God's Reach farming for new vessels, and that was never intended, right? The God's <clears throat> Reach area is really our tutorial area. Once you're advanced to the point where you're actually doing advanced vessels, I don't want you playing in God's Reach, and I really don't want you playing in Infected either. Maybe for lower vessels like green and blues, that'd be okay, but for higher rank vessels, I don't want you there. So we need to go back and take a look at that. That's part of the, the thing I talked about, about the major pillars being there but not quite working. I feel like that's another one both here and in Monsters is that we aren't we aren't graduating players to the correct world band um, that we that we intend them to be in. So I know that's an area that we need to look at, and it's something I'll get to. I just we, I'm taking these things one at a time. So yeah, ideally this pulls more people out into the world because you have to go out and essentially you're going to level up your harvesting professions, right? There is no more I can just sit around and wait 
for them. And as a benefit, that means if you go out and harvest, you can advance based on how fast or uh, how much that you can uh, harvest. As yeah, and that's another to... another area that's on my list that needs a balance pass for sure, is the relative resource production of the mother loads versus solo harvesting versus pigs versus forts is way out of whack. So I know that that's another area we've got to look at as well. We can't do everything at once. <laughs> so. Okay, so um, this is, there will be uh, five of these, one for each of the, the basic professions. Uh as far as the exploration disciplines. There's some more uh, exotic is what we're calling them. And that progression path is still in as well, uh, except it no longer drops. We got rid of the whole souls mechanic. It just straight up drops the green discipline. You don't need to have an intermediate currency for that. You just use the green discipline. Can we zoom in? I can uh, actually talk specifics about, because it's hard to see from the overall view. I just wanted to show that, okay. Uh, you should be looking at actually all of the stats on minor, and you'll notice you get the energetic harvesting. Uh, you get where you get the intermediate picks, the advanced tools, uh, the toolkits open up, and you'll also notice that we did away. So one of the things that we uh, that Matt and I did when we were in here is we went away from the specifics of you need ore. Uh, I'm sorry, you need uh, gold or copper or iron mining. It's just basically falls under the mining category, the, the parent stats. There was no reason to have those children stats anymore at all because it just bloated the hell out of your uh, your stats as well as created disciplines that had 20 stats on them. It was ridiculous. So uh, you can see that similar to major disciplines, there's the upgrade path, which is you take Three greens, you get a blue, you take three blues, and you get a purple, you take three purples, and you get a legendary. All the way up, and basically, just by out there mining, you will get those green disciplines to use to upgrade. Also, at green, you will get the advanced specialty toolkit. So if we can pop up the slide for that, please. You can see that there is a progression of these as well. And they require vendor purchase as well as more of the green disciplines that you got from whacking on, uh, or in this case, whacking on uh, ore nodes. And again, they have some of the more exotic stats that you found in the skill trees, like cutting grit. Every one of the professions has its specialty stats that are found like that. You'll also note if passives are gained through the specialty belts um, where you get specific buffs, and then you hit a point where you can branch into an A or B version. We'll try and make those as good as possible in different ways. And Todd had suggested we add even more tracks, which is great once we have kind of settled on at least an initial advancement path here. Yeah, so I, I do like the idea of an item advancement track for these other professions. I think that's definitely something that's cool. I mean, that's that's pretty common. Uh, it's the baseline advancement track of I get better at doing the thing by doing the thing that I really don't like being based around the crafting and and collection RNG game. That's the piece that that really bothers me. So that I know we needed to, to go back and take a look at that. Um, and yes, in general, also I know that our RNG has been too punishing so we need to just go back in general and take a balance pass at all of those uh, uh, i'm not even convinced that there's not some bugs in there as well because quite often it seems like um the response i hear from you guys is wow that was super painful and i go check the number and the number doesn't sound as painful and i know to some degree that could be streakiness right that's very common in rng systems um but anyway i i, I just want it gone i got i want us to move us away from that so yeah, and uh, again, we're going to tune the numbers based on the feedback we get on test. Is it too many? What, what's interesting is some people are complaining about having to go out and, and grind, but you're going to go out and chop some trees anyways, and where things are in the skill tree is far faster than it was in the passive system. The amount of stats and abilities that you will get in the, the this model is what it would have taken years in the passive skill trees to get to all of those things. So we've actually rapidly sped up the progression rate of harvesters and crafters 
compared to just having to sit around and wait for two weeks, um, which is for us, it's positive because it means active gameplay, which also means that people should be out in the world, right? I mean, all of our systems ultimately try and pull as many people out into the world as possible, A, to explore and experience new things and to find new things, but you also create PvP opportunities when people are out in the world and not just sitting in a base training. So there, there is a lot of benefits of that. Uh, okay, so let's go on to... So in 6200, you saw the beginning tendrils of this in crafting. And we weren't able to get all the way because I just ran out of time. So it was basically you had to do the soul grind as well as a time grind. So if Emily, if you could pull up the Necromancer. So a very similar overview to the one we saw with mining. Uh, the soul portion has been eliminated. The procs now just straight up proc the green version of the discipline to take uh, a little bit of that out. The legendary belts have been added and they have all kinds of goodies on them. Uh, the belt opens up, the, the belt progression opens up at green and it's very similar uh, to the mining and all of the other harvesting ones, but it's slightly different for each of the classes. And again, we're still tweaking the rates at which those things come out. It is, uh, it's definitely challenging to find a good sweet spot number that feels good and rewards you because that's the goal and to have you do the activity, which you were probably going to be doing anyways. Excuse me. And of course, okay, that's so the there was one question, which I think is an excellent one, which is, hey, with this coming, does this mean that there's going to be a wipe? So we are trying to right now look at doing a script that will go through and just do discipline wipes as opposed to wiping characters and resources and banks and everything else. So that's where I think we're at right now is I think we're just going to wipe disciplines, um, which is necessary because the old disciplines um, uh, would not work with the new system. Um, yeah, the old disciplines and the exploration souls, which aren't even used anymore, and those recipes are gone in 6300. Uh, the combat stuff remains the same. This is the uh, this is the uh, the exploration side of the house that we just need to get. Our system doesn't update templates if we change them on the back end, so we want you guys to actually use all the new ones because otherwise you look at existing ones and be like, hey, this is broken. So. Will knowledge? Yeah, there is. There is no more knowledge, guys. There is no more of those souls. Those are those are gone from this process. You just straight up get the uh, the green level discipline, and that is used as the upgrade currency. Uh, what we're going to be looking for mainly is were there numbers that were missed? Um, there could have been. Were uh, <clears throat> there may be some source that we didn't see for a specific like mining, uh, like gems or minerals? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's a massive system. So <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if, if there are some things that, that, that were, you know, either lost or fat fingered or no, there will be bugs. There always are bugs. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're looking for those. We're looking for, uh, is it too slow? Is it too fast? Does it feel good? Hey, I, I got all of these, uh, I went out and I harvested my normal harvest load. And in addition to, I was able to get enough uh, green disciplines to make a blue, right? And you'll be like, oh, hey, look, I was able to do this in a handful of days as opposed to waiting a very long time and not being able to, to advance. But again, RPG, you want to feel advancement. You want to feel good from advancement. The system's challenge of any RPG system is making it feel good um, and that, that's what we're working for. So, so we, we just had a question pop up. I've seen a couple times in chat, uh, which was there, there, we've had a link where, you know, you couldn't equip a high, a high rarity, um, discipline on a lower rarity vessel or vice versa. Like there was a, there was some, some requirements there that we intend to cut. Uh, I don't actually know. I do know that that's in the pipe as something we wanted to fix. Uh, let me go follow up and, and no, see it, where I, that. It, it, I saw the ticket get started yesterday, Todd. It should okay, by the okay, time great. they see by the time they see it on six three hundred, that will already be in there. So we'll, these screenshots are again. I, I took these uh, last week. That whole vessel line will go away. So that will just be one less uh, requirement on the requirements section. 
which was always super confusing to me anyways. I hated that we had to list out every vessel quality. It just doesn't look good on the items. Yeah. But that's going away. So yeah, you'll be able to equip any uh, discipline on any vessel. And then the final bucket, which we don't have pictures for because this is more of a design bucket. We've just basically harvested all of the stats, for a better word, from the combat trees. And now they're in our bucket of stuff we can use. So if we want to add more to the stat blocks in the talent trees, we now have a- We have numbers to do that now. We have overhead. Right. We, we have some space to do it without bumping against a number ceiling, for sure. Yeah, that was, that was one of the concerns. I mean, you get this in, in every MMO is as time goes by, there's an arms race in the player's stats and they just keep on going up. And then you get to games that have been for a while where they have to do techniques like squishing stats or squishing levels and all of those things because it's just an exponential curve. And you hit the point where you can't really offer any more advancement. So we just bought ourselves some advancement back, which is always good because it's always great to have headroom because when we enter new content, we like to give you guys rewards. And if the rewards just don't have any teeth to them because we've run out of stat headroom, it kind of sucks for, it's like, hey, I can't make my thing cool, right? So from the <laughs> designer perspective, because you always want to have the, the cool thing and everybody loves your cool thing and it's because it gives some ridiculous stats. Well, you have no headroom if you've burned it all. And we just bought a bunch back, which is great. So we've got that in the bank and we can make other things better with it. Um, and then we already talked about the wipe. So, oh, uh, somebody just asked about the leadership belt in, uh, there were some skill trees like leadership, which we are not getting rid of, but what's going to happen to something like that is it's going to become a combat discipline. So it will, it will make its way into a combat discipline. It was in exploration because it was kind of a, it gave all kinds of stats but those specific things, and, and I think it provided, it was like a six-month training sink to actually become a group leader that was all maxed out. But that will become a combat discipline, and it will go into one of the domains. Why not exploration discipline? So the exploration disciplines are really focused on the crafting track, and they're focused on the harvesting track. And then there are, if you want to be the best miner, you would pair the minor track and the minor belt with probably Foreman or Valane or one of those exotic ones. Uh, if you wanted to be the best crafter, you could equip uh, a crafting one. I mean, you have two slots. So that's something we'll also look at is, is that an appropriate number? And does it give enough uh, uh, advancement and options? Again, options are always a good thing. So I'm sure you guys will have a billion questions about this. So um, hit us up on the forums and let us know, and we'll um, try and tackle them whenever we can, either at the next Q&A or, or replying on the forums or replying over social media or whatever. So, so uh, um, just some really quick, there is a question about um, uh, alt accounts coming up as well as, well, what you're going to do is, you can only equip so many disciplines on a character. So you can't be the best grave digger, miner, logger, quarryman. Like you can't be the best at all of those things. You're going to have to pick, which standard to any MMORPG is you would probably make extra characters to, to if you want to vertically integrate and be able to do everything, you would have extra characters for that. So that will still be limited by the number of character slots you have on an account, yada, yada, yada. Oh yeah, so actually, and that that was brings up a good point. Is is we know that some people did buy alt accounts specifically because of the way passive training worked. So if you are in that position, um, we're gonna let you cash those back in for crowns that you can use to buy additional character slots or other stuff out of the store. Um, if you don't want to, if I mean, if you want to keep the alt account, you're welcome to, of course. But if you if you made your decision at least partially based on the way that design worked, and you want to swap those over to something else then that makes sense to us and we're happy to do it. You can contact customer support and we'll figure that out. And yes, day one, you will be able to craft vessels now. It has an, it's a standard progression mechanic. Go out and dig up some body parts, sew them together, get some advancement on your necromancy and you can start that cycle right off the bat. So I'm sure part of 
starting a fresh campaign, like if we do a no import campaign, like if you think about the big top level implications of this, you now have a clear tech tree that doesn't involve waiting or how long you've played this game. You basically know the path you need to go get. If the first thing you need to build is vessels for your guild, then you focus on everybody grab grave digging and go out there and start digging up and then start making vessels, right? If we need to focus on armor and weapons, take that path. You basically have a tech tree now that you follow down to get to where you need to go. And it doesn't involve waiting. It's all about you going out and doing it, which ideally, like I said before, puts more players out in the world actually available as targets for PvP scenarios, right? That's the whole thing. We always want to pull people into the world if we can. We built this giant, big, beautiful world, and we want you guys to play in it. Okay. All right. right, so do you want to hit the questions now? I did see a couple of people asking about performance, so I'll give a quick update on that. As we, <laughs> as you guys know, we spent, uh, I think it was five or six weeks with the Unity, um, a dedicated team that from Unity helping us go through. Um, we have a laundry list of changes between now and launch. A chunk of them did make it into 6300. A chunk of them will go into 6400. We'll just keep going through that list kind of in priority order between now and launch to try and get um, as much performance performance increases we can. So hopefully you'll see some nice improvements in this next version and continue to see improvements between now and launch. Uh, and somebody said, are there basic and intermediate shovels? Yes. I replicated the entire crafting path or harvesting path that all of the other professions have with grave digging. It's no longer advanced. What's What was nice was the assets were already there for me in the repo. Somebody had already built basic and intermediate icons and the actual 3D mesh shovels, so I had them. So it was, it was one of those nice things where I didn't need to go ask for more art. It already was there, just not being used. All right, okay, so we had a couple questions from the forums I think we wanted to take, so yes. yeah, we yeah, should yeah. do that before I get sucked off into just um, land of answering everybody who uh, uh, asks anything over chat. So it's very okay. easy for me to, to fall into that trap. So. Okay, so question one. Does anyone know how bleeds actually work? Do they stack? Does the highest damage overwrite the current bleed? And the answer to this question is prior to 6200, we had two different kinds of every dot. We had a major and a minor. And it was confusing that the minor stacked to three. And at any point, they could be overwritten by a major. So we just flattened all of that into there's one type of dot now, there's one bleed, it doesn't stack, similar to all of the other dots that we have. New applications of that dot refresh the current one, they don't override it. However, for all of the disciplines that say when you apply a bleed or when you apply whatever, we're actually going through and updating those powers to give you credit for applying it if it would have applied, but there was already one there. It was just a flattening and clarification of the system. And uh, you'll, I mean, that's, that's in our general philosophy that you guys are going to see now, which is simplify, simplify, simplify. Like let's, how do we get this thing? And we, you know, go through and, and take, take some sandpaper and get the rough edges off the things that just aren't working. How do we simplify them down? Yep. So, uh, okay. Uh, question two. Is Sands of Time and Spider Ember only dropping if the Divine Favor card is present by design? So did we intend for that to happen? Yes. And the answer is yes, <laughs> right? So we didn't want people stockpiling those things ahead of time in case that victory card could show up. We basically got some sweet tech that enables us to drop uh, loot based on the presence of things like a Divine Favor card. So that, that's some pretty cool tech. I'd love to leverage it for more things in the future, like more events and things like that, where things only can be looted if another certain thing has been done. And we now actually have the tech pieces to make that happen, which is pretty cool. Um, question three. Why do I see stats that my character doesn't have in the details page, i.e. mana and fury? And this is one thing that Todd, I think, had been harping on me for three years now. Yes, I, it drove me bonkers. 
<laughs> he, he literally <laughs> like a character that doesn't use the rage mechanic and I see rage and all the stats related to it. Like that drove me crazy. It was funny because I was like, uh, he's going to the details page again. Yep. He's going to complain about that one again. And it was funny as we, it just, it took this long to get through the system because it was so super minor from a, uh, from a play perspective, but it actually is pretty important when you actually start looking at your details page for the first time and you're trying to figure out stats and things, and there's just all this extra stuff. So in 6300, uh, we now have the tech to hide stats that we don't want to show a particular class. So you will only see your class specific resource. And then over on actually on all three tabs of the details page, we went ahead and optimized out a lot of stats that we didn't need to show anymore or kind of got clipped in the skills to uh, active progression mechanic. So those things should be much tighter now. You shouldn't see things that you don't need. And we're trying to make it as leather, as understandable as possible. So look forward to that on 6300 when that comes up. Okay, uh, question four. What happened to the horseshoe recipe? So this is the centaur-specific race uh, extra stat item that they get. And the answer is it never got added to the treasure tables in one of our migrations of where loot was being shifted around. And thanks to some questions to people like, hey, where is this thing? We went digging and found where to put it. So you should see it on the Embari group and raid bosses in 6300. Which, hooray, found a missing thing. Okay, question five. Can we get more extra small tokens in the EKs? Okay, so we, uh, y yes, eventually we are going to do a balance of the tokens, but for right now, the easier answer for us was to take all of the token requirements off the attachables. So if you have an attachable for a vendor or for a chest, they no longer require an extra small token slot. Uh, the only thing that does is the vendor stall that you can attach to the outside of your smaller buildings does require an extra small token slot. So that's an inherent benefit to any of the larger buildings that can take vendors directly, which they should be able to now, uh, is that they don't require a uh, that stall. So therefore the vendor can be added directly and there's no cost. Um, so those changes are going Going in in this version as well, 6.300. Cool. Uh, that was definitely, that was a, a pretty big complaint I saw about the EK. So there you go. Can we get more bank space? Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, uh, we can. So actually, so this ties into another question, which which I, I um, have has been hanging out there for a while, right? Which is what are the benefits of VIP? Um, we don't have the full chart, right? There's some things that we're still working out, like what are my EK benefits for VIP and stuff like that. But there are a couple things that I think we are okay now announcing that will be part of the benefit of VIP. Um, one of them is respec. So we're going to actually put a respec into the game. And if you are a VIP, you can respec your character and respend all your talent points and your attribute points. Um, I like that one because it's clearly a convenience. It is not pay to win because you're not getting a benefit other people can't get. Um, but it is a big convenience because it means if you want to go and take a character and undo one of the decisions you made, you can go back to the temple and talk to an NPC and you can hit respec. Actually, I think it's not even on NPC. I think it may just be a button uh, i'll have to go check um but uh that one is not in this build it's in the next build work is being done on it right now um and then there's another one that we are putting in which is in increased uh bank space and vault space so vip will also have larger um storage for both bank and for vault so um so there you go there's two two of the vip benefits and we have a few more that are that are cooking up and and they're coming so it's 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 interesting and it's a, a tough design problem, right? Because we we have said from the very beginning that we we don't want VIP to add more power to a player. We want to make it convenience, but we also want it to be valuable enough that people want to buy it because that's how we're going to continue to maintain to pay our people to maintain the game and to grow it over time. So um, so we're trying to find the way to to thread that needle. So um, I think that those are two that that to me seemed like really nice benefits, but also uh, they didn't seem uh, in any way pay to win. So I, that's why I thought those were pretty good, pretty solid. You stole my question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was question one on the forums and chat. 
Was uh, one question. question was, what does respect do? So does it allow for race and class switching? It does not. It allows for switching of everything else, but you can't change. Well, you can't change cosmetics and you can't change your race. and You can't change your class, but it does allow for respect of attribute points, talent points. Uh, and disciplines are in a kind of an interesting and odd spot is um, we didn't want to necessarily flush your disciplines because you may want to respect back into them. So what we're going to do is leave the disciplines on your character. But if you no longer hit the prereq for them, invalidate them until you hit the prereq as well. So that basically puts it in your hands. If you want to, you can then earn your way back up into that. Uh, making it valid and it just turns back on. You don't have to go and find it again. Um, if you want to get rid of it, you can just dump it and replace it with something else. So there you go. Okay, that was that that was question uh, one from the forums and chat. Are you taking uh, my questions? Yeah, Diane, do you want to do? Uh... <laughs> well, before I start with the question, what we're going to do is announce the new castle that's coming to the dregs. And Emily, if you can. Cue that video, please. Yeah, actually, I really like the glass on the, that building, the, the front of it. The, the front of the yeah, house. it's a really cool building. And there's actually, this is, um, there's multiple versions of this, right? It gets bigger and bigger because this is the same uh, building that we have for the EKs for the early backers who got like mountain citadels and palaces and things like that. Um, it is a, it's a pretty cool area. In the dregs, what we're doing is setting one particular zone that just has this in it because we expect that people will fight over it. Initially, I had them just make it equal to a keep only because I didn't want to deal with the balance while we're bringing this thing on because it is a monster. Um, but it should be an interesting play space for people to fight over. And yes, the tree is inside. They're asking. It's a very big tree, so yeah, and it's on the second floor, so it creates some interesting uh, fight spaces uh, where you can get knocked off of that second floor and be underneath the tree and have to get back up there. Love the dragon. Looks so cool. Okay, cool. So let's get to the questions. Um, you answered the community's question from Adius. What will be in the VIP? Next we have from Atreus. Will there be another no import dregs? Or no import yeah, I'm sure there will be. I, I actually haven't looked into that recently. Um, we've been so caught up in the new um, milestones that uh, we haven't been doing a lot in terms of, of varying up the existing live campaign. So I know we need to get back to that. But yeah, I definitely love having uh, no import campaigns time to time. Um, it'll certainly be a lot uh, interesting, a lot uh, easier and more interesting now once passive training is gone as well, because it means that people can hit the ground running right when they come in, even if we do a wipe, which again, we're not planning on doing for this one. Yeah, I, I think that that's one of the things that actually even made this an issue for so long, Todd, was the disparity in the passive training and the no import and not being able to do anything. And pretty much all of that should be gone now, right? I mean, you have a path to go out and just instantly start progressing down the harvesting tree to get the stuff that you can craft and protect, uh, go down those trees. So, I mean, I, I think it'll feel different now that you can actually go do something about progressing. Okay, next question from Feist Keebler. Feist Keebler, any team members, what's your favorite aspect of the game and why? So mine is, uh, this is something that I alluded to earlier, but I, I'm really happy with the decision to do the race class split. Like, I look back on all the things we've done. I know it was expensive and painful and time consuming, but I'm really glad that we made that call. I would have been very unhappy um, with the game if we hadn't uh, decided to go down that path. Yeah, and I, that is definitely, it opened up a lot. <laughs> In fact, it opened up what might be said as too many races because there's a <laughs> whole lot of races and you guys don't see the cost of that, but that also uh, has a significant animation cost and all those other things. Oh, but there's yeah, a reason that you don't see though so many racial options in in most MMOs, right? And most of the time, especially the ones that come out of the West, uh, the the races are all variants of human with different head, <laughs> like or scaled up human. Um, that's generally what they go for. But, uh, but I'm glad that we did it. The scaled down, the scaled down human. Yeah, for sure. Just squish him. <laughs> 
All right, next question, okay. unemployed balloon. What's the most memorable or interesting to y'all things that players have come up with meta-wise that's perhaps wasn't planned or specifically designed? I think my favorite was the time that um, people figured out they could run up the side of the trebuchet to get over the walls. <laughs> I think that was pretty <laughs> hilarious. They were using the collision of the um, of the siege weapons to basically make do makeshift ladders. I think that was pretty funny. So um, one person that uh, just was asking about arena, like five on five arena, one on one arena. So one of the things that we did have on our Kickstarter um, list of, of of stretch goals was a tournament system, and I've been thinking about that quite a bit lately. Um, is you know how can we how can we basically put together something that allows people for more of an arena type experience because we have all the pieces. Um, I'm not quite sure what the answer is there, but I'm trying to come up with something uh, to give us that basically so that we can have guilds. It'll probably be invitation only. Like hey, we're going to invite guilds probably based on how they did in campaigns, and we'll be able to do. In individual tournaments or something. I don't know what the answer is there, but I'm definitely thinking about it. It's something that I, that I, well, I mean, it's something that we said we wanted to do back in Kickstarter. Uh, it was the, I think 1.3 or 1.6, somewhere along in there, million dollar stretch goal. So, so doing something that's small scale and uh, more bite-sized as well. I kind of a bite-sized mini dregs is, is what I'm thinking. So that moves us on from the question area that uh, we have prearranged. Let's talk about another thing that is coming up. One of our more uh, infamous events that I still can't believe we named them Decapathons, but Decapathons is what we have. I love so the name. Decapathon 4 is coming soon. So in uh, December over the holidays, we'll announce the dates. We're going to be doing another Decapathon. And as everybody, I really like the skulls. I really like our waste items. I think they look cool. They're a great way to customize your character. Uh, and the little attachable units that, that pop on in the various spots on your character. Yeah, those are pretty cool. Yeah, the, especially the skulls. They're the they're the ones that only come from decapathons. And we've done three decapathons so far. This will be number four. Uh, lead your faction to victory by sacrificing skulls to Maeve. The victorious faction will triumph earning a skull belt attachment with a bonus stat. That's all TBD, but uh, WC really wanted to do another decapathon, so there you go. And we've got our standard crow rewards. So if you're a backer by the 24th of the month, you'll receive this month's reward plus all other upcoming rewards. Uh, all crow appreciation rewards will be added as an entitlement to your account, and you'll be able to claim them in game at launch. Our December Crow reward is a Warcry emote, and you see here we have a Minotaur doing the Warcry. Uh, and <laughs> the text that goes along with these is always delightful. Uh, intimidate your enemies with a ferocity of an eternal Crow warrior. Unleash the Warcry emote to evoke fear in all that stand in your way. <laughs> so Some I was scarier uh, with the Santa hat on. <laughs> Is it? Yes. <laughs> okay. I hope you all have a happy holidays. I mean, we're, we are approaching that time of year. It is December. The cold just hit us here in Texas. I think today is our first freeze of the year. Do you have any uh, passing comments? Have a forum? Uh, have a no, I just want to say, so this has been a crazy year for us, obviously. I mean, we, you know, we've, <laughs> we haven't seen our teammates for, <laughs> the better part of the year, like most people, right? But it, um, I want to thank everybody for sticking with us. You know, this has been definitely one of the most interesting development processes I've ever been through de developing live and in front of the crowd. Uh, you know, I often use the example of, it's, you know, it's like people believed in the idea of our restaurant. So they put in their orders and then we had to go build the kitchen, not just make their meals, but build the kitchen so that we could serve their orders. And you guys, some of y'all have been around uh, since the beginning. I, somebody mentioned Hunger Dome in the, in the chat. I thought that was funny. That was so long ago now. But um, uh, I'm I'm. I'm pleased with how the game has come along in this amount of time. We've got a bunch of the stuff that we uh, originally thought would work really well. We've we've tried and it has a bunch of the stuff that we thought would work really well. We've tried it hasn't. We've adapted. We've changed. You guys have been 
basically with us every step of the way, which is really cool. We don't normally have players involved at every step of the development process. So I want to just thank you guys for, uh, you know, 2020 has been a trying year for lots of reasons, having nothing to do with us. But you guys have always been there for us. And so I want to thank you for it. Uh, I know the team really appreciates it. You know, ultimately, we're making this game for you. That's what we set out to do was make a game that you guys would enjoy. And uh, we, we take that a duty very, very seriously. And I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to do it. And I hope that when we're done, you will look back and be thankful of, uh, of not just what we produce, but also the journey. I think it's pretty cool um, to have been along, to have you guys along for the ride. So uh, somebody's asking about six, three, six, three hundred. And the answer is soon. So it's not quite to the point where we can get it up on the test server, but we have now taken the test server down or we're taking it down in preparation for it to come up. So um, hopefully soon we're trying to get through those bugs so we can get it out in front of you guys. Continue yep. your conversations on the forums. I made a forum thread for the live stream. She did takes us all over that. So, so yeah, please do. Um, if, if we don't respond personally, know that the information is getting passed up to us. Yeah. And we will have uh, the flow charts up. So you guys yeah. know how to, how to, how and what to do on test when you're testing out the new, more active uh, training stuff or exploration disciplines. I'll get to them. Cool. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Thanks for coming out, as always. And until early next year, I suppose in January, we will see you guys in the forums and see you in game. Bye. See you later. All right. Bye. See you guys.